Hello everybody, this is The Stream's online pre-show. I'm Femi O.K. In the United States, controversial killings of unarmed black men by white police officers continue to raise questions about police conduct and what it takes for officers to face criminal charges. To help us talk about this, we have our online community. We have Malika Blau and a, a stellar lineup of guests as well. Get to the guests in just a moment. Right. What are you seeing online? I, I know you, you're looking at protests that are currently ongoing right now. Ongoing, right, which is the beauty of a live show. So yeah. there are uh, protests nationwide uh, around the U.S. where people are, are protesting against police brutality, California, New York, other places. And they're using the hashtag uh, stop A14, shut it down A14, excuse me. So, of course, you can follow along that hashtag. hashtag. You can also follow along with hashtag AJ Stream to see our conversation here. Now, a conversation on this show, we have Muyadeen Dabaha, a black Black Lives Matter organizer from Charleston, Eugene Ramirez, hello, he's a police defense attorney and former mm. police officer, hi there Eugene, Morgan Hargrave is a program manager at Witness, that's an international organization that trains and supports people using video in their fight for human rights, and Jamila King is a staff writer at Take Part, that's a digital magazine, great to have you all here everybody. By way of a warm up, I was just thinking, what is the most memorable experience you've ever had with the police? Good or bad? Let me show mine with you so you know how brief to keep it. Um, a little while ago, somebody tried to mug me. I fought them back and then ran home and called the police. And about four detectives turned up and all of them apologized mm. profusely as if they were the person who had tried to mug me. It was a really positive experience apart from the fact I had a few bruises and I was mugged by the police. That is my experience of police in America. Uh, Morgan, tell us your uh, memorable experience of police. My memorable experiences have all come through a screen just like this mm. um, in recent years. Yeah. And going all the way back to 24 years ago, 1991, uh, Rodney King, beaten by the LAPD, that oh. was filmed by um, a man named George Holliday, who was a plumber who happened to live right, right by where that incident was happening. He pulled out his camera. So sure. my whole life... Um, I've been watching um, interactions with the police um, right. through a screen like this. Um, I'm blessed to have not had to have um, too many interactions, positive or negative, um, Let's move on. so far. Yeah, interesting. Eugene, for you, your most memorable well, experience of police, in a nutshell, very briefly. Well, I come from a different perspective, so yeah. I didn't have to say when I was a police officer arresting my first burglar, I didn't know who was more scared, him <laughs> or me, Yikes. holding him at gunpoint. Fortunately, yeah. he followed my commands. I took him into custody without any force being used, wow. and he was convicted for his crimes. Wow. Okay. That beats my potential mugging story, hands down. <laughs> Muyadeen, for you, your most memorable experience of police in America? What? My most memorable, I mean, my first experience, my real experience, I was probably maybe seven years old, traffic stop. My father gets pulled out of the car. He's arguing with the police. He gets taken off. I'm sitting around in this car wow. waiting for my mom to come get me. Oh, so, Jim, Jamila. I, so that's first and oh, foremost. Oh, that's really sad. Uh, Jamila, for you, I've got 30 seconds left for you. Yeah, Go so for it. similarly, I was yelled at by a cop when I was like seven or eight years old. I was on a field trip yeah. and we got to play with police gadgets and I guess I played with the wrong one and that was not the thing to do. So I was yelled at by a cop. That was not a positive experience by any means. Wow. Um, so it wasn't very happy. Right. It's really intriguing to, to hear about our interactions with police here in the United States. We're going to be very focused on uh, what happens when police shoot unarmed a black man and how, what do we do about that and is there a culture of that. We're taking that conversation to our main show in 30 seconds time. Sit tight, everybody. Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, who polices the police as unarmed black men continue to be shot and killed by white police officers? We look at ways to monitor police conduct in the United States. There's a lot of conversation going on online right now about how do you tackle this issue with police shooting unarmed black men. Malika Blau is our digital producer. You are wrangling a lot of that conversation. What are you seeing? Well, one of the suggestions many people can point to is the use of body cameras. Mm -hmm. Now, those can be used to keep an eye on the police. And so many people reference a case in Rialto, California, where body cameras have reduced the use of force. And if you're curious to know how much it went down in that town, you can download our app and take our quiz to find out. 
I'm Jeremy Morley. I'm an international family lawyer in New York. I handle international family law cases around the world, and I am in the stream. In the United States, controversial killings of unarmed black men by white police officers continue to raise questions about police conduct and what it takes for officers to face criminal charges. The latest incident to gain national attention happened last week. Walter Scott, a 50-year-old unarmed black man, was pulled over for having a minor traffic violation by Michael Slager. He's a white police officer. Now, minutes later, eight shots were fired at Scott as he was trying to run away, five of those shots hitting him. The shooting was filmed on the mobile phone of a bystander and later led to the officer being fired and formally charged with murder. The video evidence reignited conversations across the country about ways to monitor police conduct and hold them accountable for their actions. To help us talk about this, we're joined by Muyadine Dabaha. He's a Black Lives Matter organizer from Charleston. Eugene Ramirez is a police defense attorney and former police officer. Morgan, hello there, good afternoon. Morgan Hargrave is program manager at Witness. That's an international organization that trains and supports people using video in their fight for human rights. And Jamila King is a staff writer at Take Part, a digital magazine where she covers race relations in the US. Good to have you all here, everybody. Eugene, as a former police officer, when you saw that Walter Scott video, what did you see? How, what did you make of it? Well, I was shocked about it just like everybody else was in this country. I saw something that should not have occurred and that officer deserves to be criminally prosecuted for what I saw. But again, none of us were there. We shouldn't rush to judgment. Right. It doesn't look good, but we have to let the justice system work its way through. Sure. Uh, there's a very personal connection, Muyadine, that you have to this video because the person who took the video, well, he brought it to you, right? Tell us that story. For sure. And so that evening of the murder, I uh, received a message from brother with some pictures, and those pictures showed the distance between the officer in full stance and Walter Scott running away. After receiving those pictures, after they imprinted upon my psyche, my consciousness, I knew what, what, what was the case, and I actually understood the fact that all these stories that have been told around profiling, harassment, brutality, I already knew as a black man in America all those stories are true, but finally those stories might be validated. But back by to this public. video though, I want to hear how you got hold of the video and, and what you did with that for video. For sure, sure, for sure. All right, cool. So in the morning time, uh, we met up uh, at a certain location. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Santana, uh, the memorial was down the street from where Walter Scott was shot. Yeah. And so I went down there and contacted the family and you know, whispered in their ear and let them know, you know, we have some evidence, we have something that's really gonna give you some peace to your heart. Yeah. Um, come on down the road. And so they drove me down the road to where the video was. Uh, they sat in the back seat of the car with the brother that had the video. They watched it, they came out disoriented, crying, feeling the emotion of the moment, the gravity of the moment. We sat around and prayed and, and really just sat there for a little bit. And I remember just one time looking in Brother Tony Scott's face and and him him telling us, it's like, this is it. This is it. And right. so as an organizer, as activist, you know, I take that as a green light. This is the one that, that is going to end it. And this, this is going to change the world and it has to change the world. And if this one doesn't change the world, then we're living in hypocrisy. We are We are yeah. steeped in hypocrisy and we do not deserve to say that we live in democracies. See, Morgan, you're nodding. I I'm just curious about if this video hadn't come to light, what do you think might have happened to police officer Slager? I, listen, these videos, um, this video, Eric Gardner, going 24 years all the way back to 1991 um, with the beating of Rodney King, a video shot by bystanders um, who had the awareness, in this case, Fadeen Santana, I'm blown away, the awareness and the courage to step up and pull out his camera and stay there and catch this whole scene. Mm. These make the entire difference between um, seeing action taken and not. Um, in some cases, it's outside the, the purview of even a powerful video like this to get a trial, um, much less a conviction. Um, but as these videos come out, the cumulative effect, the power of these citizen videos for advocacy and for evidence, is, uh, is something that we see all over the world really taking over, this sort of era of citizen witnessing from the Middle East to South America, 
uh, to movements here in the United States in Charleston and, uh, and beyond. Well, you know, it's interesting you said that, Morgan. There are people online, of course, who agree with you because they have these tools in their hands. So a bloggy writes with apps like Periscope, that's a live streaming app, YouTube capture, et cetera. Bystanders can now easily broadcast and record police activities. But then, on the other hand, Jamila, um, as Morgan referenced, we got this Facebook comment, and this is what she says. This is Elizabeth, and she writes, just look at that Eric Garner case that happened in New York, where watching the video of the police choking a man to death wasn't enough to secure an indictment. And she goes on to say, until real, timely, and proportionate conviction sentences are handed down, more video will simply be more video, not more justice. Jamila, what do you think of that? So mm. technology alone cannot be the only solitary pathway to justice. I think what no, videos no. can do is provide a small route to getting accountability. Um, I had a, a colleague, Rebecca McCray at Take Part, who wrote a really interesting article that, you know, if you look at the seven or eight years between when Oscar Grant was killed in Oakland, California by a transit officer and when, you know, Walter Scott was killed a few weeks ago, what you see is, you know, video evidence that was taken seriously very quickly. Um, you know, with, with Oscar Grant, that video evidence came out and it took weeks for that officer to be charged with manslaughter. In this case, it only took a few days. And I think because there's been such a movement around the country with folks from Black Lives Matter, with uh, so many activists coming forward and actually putting a narrative to this, right? Because so many of these instances happen. And I think what you've seen in the past few years is that activists, Black activists specifically, have built a very powerful narrative that this is, these are not isolated incidents and these need to be actually addressed. Eugene, let me it's play... It's a shame... Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, Eugene, and then, and then I'll... I'll I just, I just, I feel it's a shame that, that we have to create a narrative that has an audio-visual vid component when, in fact, people have been saying for now hundreds of years that we're being abused, profiled, harassed, and terrorized. And now the speculation machines of the media, our media that we get to have, just because that speculation can give a perspective to a media spectacle that can be sold and maybe perhaps convince the public that maybe all these black and brown people that have been saying all this time they've been being harassed and profiled, maybe we'll believe them. And so again, this is not a victory. A victory is to protect people from dying, not have videos of them dying. And so instead of just taking a video, if Mr. Santana said, I am watching you, maybe Walter Scott would be alive. If everybody that was watching Eric Gardner said, you know what, he said he can't breathe, I'm gonna get this policeman off of him. And so uh, all of us standing around talking about social justice, but not about stepping out and actually making sure these things don't happen, capturing a nice video that's gonna be played over and over again. We're very familiar and we're very comfortable with the suffering of a black body. We're too comfortable with that. Who's the where? Stop where? taking who, videos who, and go. Dean, who's, who's the where? Who's the where too comfortable? Who, who are you talking about here? I'm talking about anybody who uh, takes in the spectacle that is created around the suffering of a black body. They were hanging from trees before. They were being beat. They were being sold all across the, 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 the Atlantic Ocean. Like, this is a very familiar concept. Let me to, just bring us up Western to date. Mind, Let me just bring us up to date, Maria Dean. This is the mayor of North Charleston. This is his reaction to what he saw on video to the charge of police officer Slager. And this happened a day or two after all the video surfaced. Have a listen to this. Today, I made an executive decision and have notified my council. We have already ordered this morning an additional 150 body cameras so that every officer that's on the street in uniform will have a body camera. So, Eugene, police officers with body cameras, is that helpful? Does that change the way that they could possibly work? Body-worn cameras, obviously the new trend. Yeah. I don't like the fact that people are presupposing that cops are criminals just because someone dies when they're struggling. Let's look at the actions of the suspects. Uh -huh. Body-worn cameras are gonna assist and both law enforcement and the media and the public to take a look at certain incidents, but only after they've been thoroughly investigated. Body-worn cameras only provide one view, not a complete view, and you have to take all the evidence into consideration before you make a judgment. They are going to help, there's no doubt about it, but they're not gonna solve 100% all the problems. Sure, I mean, there have been some studies that show that when police officers start wearing cameras, body cameras, that the instances of violence arrests or violence assaults, they, they go down. 
That's true. Rialto showed uh, their use of force went down 88%. Yeah. The number of complaints against officers went down 60%. So body-worn cameras will change behavior, hopefully, not only in police, but also the people with whom they come into contact. So as long as the citizens behave as well, the officers are going to behave, and that's what sure. we're seeking, for everybody to behave. You know, so Rocky, just, Dean, you, you made a comment earlier, and I, and I want to bring this up because you made a comment and we got this tweet. Uh, you said something like, um, I already know how these stories were true, and so now a wider community is seeing them. So Emily writes in on Twitter, I mourn Walter Scott, and I mourn the fact that so many African Americans, my fellow citizens, are entirely unsurprised by how he was murdered. But Jamila, keeping that in mind, I wanna to go to this next tweet to push this forward a little because um, Nick on Twitter says, this is a superficial solution, the body cameras that we're talking about. The issue is actually structural and it's deep rooted. Police officers are products of a racist society. And this is what this person on Twitter is saying, but they're getting at the point that this is deeper than just having a camera or not having a camera and it won't make it go away. Right, I'll so I think one point. of the issues with police with body cameras in general is that they're emblematic of something that's much larger, which is that we don't have much reliable data to know why certain police officers do things and why other ones don't. So in the studies that do exist around, you know, body cameras being on police officers and those, those officers or those um, police forces experiencing drops in crimes and reports, it, it's really unclear why that is, right? We don't know if maybe those officers are getting better training. We don't know if they have more resources, right? And also the cameras are really expensive to maintain, you know? So we also have instances, right, where you have an Eric Garner, where you have an Oscar Grant, where you have a Walter Scott even, where, you know, their murders are caught on camera, right? And then at the most an officer gets 11 months and, and folks are not happy with that because that is not the value of a black life. And so, you know, I think there's a lot that goes into this, but first and foremost, it shows just how little we know about why police officers do what we do, what they do. Sure. And until we know what the problem is, we can't really work to fix it. Eugene, you're well, frowning. Other issues that, Go ahead. I'm gonna say there's other issues you need to be aware of. Yeah. On average, officers are assaulted 54,000 times a year. That's about 150 officers being assaulted every day. Last year, 50 officers were killed by gunfire. Two were assaulted in which their death resulted. Another 10 were killed by being struck by cars. Both sides need to figure out what is going on here. Why are so many officers being assaulted and shot? Why are officers shooting suspects? Let's take a look and see what's going on. Obviously, there's a disconnect between our communities and law enforcement. One way to help resolve this disconnect is through body-worn cameras. I think it is going to help, but realize body-worn cameras are not gonna show everything. We have issues of storage and storage costs, yeah. which I think police departments are realizing they can't afford. So we can't have cameras on 24 seven. Departments just can't afford that storage. All right, uh, Eugene, you're, you're nodding your head or shaking your head, disagreeing yeah, with so Eugene, because why? The reality is, I'll take you to North Charleston, South Carolina. North Charleston, South Carolina, Charleston in particular was the biggest slave port in South Carolina, right? There's economic speculation of, of human beings of a different skin tone. Now, again, that word speculation is important because there's been a speculation machine that has created institutions, that have created media, that have created law and order based upon that economic speculation that has never been fully dissolved. So we're dealing with the remnants of a legacy of institutional racism where overseers control a population of slaves. Now, if you understand what Charleston, South Carolina is, you'll come here and you'll see a lot of different plantations and a lot of different sure. good Mia Dean, you're, you're speaking like a, a sociologist states. and there's a, obviously there's some sociology in this conversation, but also I want to be a bit practical as well. So we have people now, citizens, taking video. Is that enough to police the police as we were talking about at the very beginning of this show? How, how do we monitor police to make sure that they are good yeah, citizens it's, it's, too? I think there's an understanding of what the, the utility of a police officer and what police do in what community. Police for whom and for what is the question. It's right. not about monitoring their culture and what they're doing. It's why is one community having so many police officers all around it? Why is the economic world around that community forcing an underground economy to flourish that automatically criminalizes a lifestyle? Those are the questions that need to be talked about. Right now, we're talking about symptoms that are going to maintain the power structure. Body cameras are going to maintain a power structure. We're not trying to do that. We, we have to understand there's a, some deep things that have to change, and that implicit bias is not going to go away because right. an officer is walking around with a camera, right? right. It's going to go away because we say 
We have a citizen's review board. And you know what, officer? We have subpoena powers. You f this community, you're out. That's what we need to be saying. That's the kind of reality that the officers need to feel from the community. So you're not walking around with a pompous attitude okay. thinking you can push people around so, because you have a badge. We, we, we have a mixed audience here, so do be careful of your language because we have youngsters and people of every age watching as well. So do watch that. Malika, go ahead. Well, I hear what Mohyuddin was saying about that power structure, but mm -hmm. there is a point being made online uh, that references something Eugene brought up earlier. And this is uh, this tweet kind of sums that up. Don't condemn the profession for the failure of an individual or individuals. And one of those hashtags is Blue Lives Matter. You see here, a policeman doesn't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm going to kill someone. And I know some people will argue with that, but before they do, I want to play this video comment. This is from a former police officer, Eugene, and, and I'll direct this to you. Law enforcement is about trust. And most people, most young men and women, you know, enter the, the, the profession of law enforcement uh, because they want to serve their community. And so clearly if they sense that there is a segment of the population that, that mistrusts them for, um, you know, a, a variety of reasons, I'm sure it, it impacts uh, how they feel about, uh, about performing their job. And I have talked to uh, many officers, many officers here in Albuquerque who are approaching retirement age, and many of them can't wait to get to that point that they can retire. And a lot of that, or some of that anyway, uh, clearly has to do with how they perceive others are perceiving them. So Eugene, he talks about mistrust. What does that mistrust do to police work in these communities? I work here in Los Angeles and I represent several law enforcement agencies here in Southern California. And I was recently tied to some of my clients, both black, Hispanic, and white. And all of them, because they were all involved in the same case, talking to me saying, Gene, no one in our community trusts us. We can't do our job. We don't feel like we're being supported by the community. Why are we going out there, putting our lives on the line for those members of this community who aren't gonna help us, aren't gonna support us, aren't gonna stand up and say, yes, these officers did nothing wrong. It is frustrating and it's a morale uh, a buster for them right now because they hear all this rhetoric that all cops are bad and they're not. Yeah. We had a bad situation, Charleston, absolutely. And you, hopefully he will be held accountable. Uh -huh. Not every yeah. shooting is necessarily a crime or something because the officer did wrong. Let me just, sure. let me, that, let me just. That trust is definitely earned. And that trust isn't given just because you're wearing a badge. You're still a human being with a character. And if your character is not influenced uh, and you don't have the morality and the ethical judgment in a way to wear that badge, if you're walking around with implicit bias, if you're walking around harassing and terrorizing people, but those people have no mechanism to not only say that, but then to pull you aside and really question and investigate your integrity within their community. Do you understand what kind of trust I must have for somebody to walk around in my community with a gun? That's that a respect lot of goes trust. two ways, sir. That respect's got to go two ways. I agree with you. Law enforcement has got to earn the trust of the community. Likewise, exactly. the people exactly. in that community have to show some respect for law enforcement. It's a two-way yeah. street here. All right, I good. All get good. Together, I've, got it's Dean, be I've got Eugene agreeing with each other. Why I have that agreement going on? Let me play you a little clip from MSNBC. That's a cable station here in the United States. This gentleman's called Fidel and Santana. Probably, arguably, the reason why we're even having this conversation today. He took the video of Walter Scott. Here he explains why he took the video. Have a listen to this. I saw the police report. I, I read it. It wasn't like that, the way they were saying. You read the re police report? Yes, yes. And I saw on the news, you know, and I said, no, you know, this is not the right, um, this is not what happened. And I had, you know, a friend of mine, and I showed a video to him. I saw, I tell him what I witnessed, and he was agreed with me. So, you know, he told me, think about, you know, what do you want to do with this, like I say. And I just, put myself in the position of the family. Morgan, how does somebody like Fidel and Santana, how does he help us with this whole mindset, this respect between the community and the police? How does he help us get in that direction? Or is it just a trivial thing? It's just another milestone in uh, African-American and police relations here in the United States. No, I think it goes back to something that Eugene said earlier, which is, you know, even with body cams, we're getting, they give us one perspective of an event. Um, and that's why it's so exciting to see people like Ferin Santana stand up and have the awareness 
and the courage to pull out their cameras and learn about their rights to film and learn how to do so effectively. And, you know, he clearly put lots of care into thinking about what he was filming, yeah. what he was going to do with it and what the response would be. And that's really exciting to see. And that's something that we need more of. Sure. Jimila, you're also nodding your head there. Yeah, so I mean, I think that when you get to this question of individuals and is are these a few bad bad oranges or bad apples, I, you know, it's it's always bigger than one person. It's a process, and I think what a lot of folks have said here is that the process of policing and the system of institutional racism are things that fundamentally need to be evaluated or reevaluated. Um, and so, you know, I think it's great that people feel empowered to videotape instances of police abuse when they see them. Um, but, you know, I think that also there are departmental things, and I'm not a cop, so I can't say what those are, but there are serious changes that need to happen, you know, to the points that were made earlier about the way that you earn trust in the community and the way that folks feel safe mm -hmm. and the way that they can then hold you accountable when you step out of line. So, yeah, Mohideen, I, I know that um, you have a, a list of things that you want to see happen for this accountability to happen that Jamila just talked about. Uh, I have a tweet here that I'm directing to you from Aaron, and he says, accountability is key, but who's to be held accountable for police violence, individuals, the department? We must understand that first. So on the top of that list, Mohideen, what do you want to see first? For sure. So within that Citizens Review Board, that power to subpoena, again, to pull in that officer, summon him to court and say, we have this instance where there's five people that are saying that you've been harassing them recently. We are going to discipline you. We're going to affect your training. You're going to affect your recruitment, your advancement, and the policy of how you deploy your, your, your energy within this particular community. Second, we want to be able to look back at officers and see kind of their, their mode of conduct within a particular community and have that information available to a community member as an app on their phone so they know what officer they're dealing with when they pull up trying to give them a ticket. So there's pure transparency there that, oh, right, I'm dealing with this officer right now. All right, cool. Well, you know, I'll make sure that I'm aware of that. And I think that kind of awareness, right. unfortunately, is going to deal with the reality of the situation. Morgan, well, what did you want to add? So much on the police officers. Right. Maybe we should also provide training to citizens. When an officer tells you to do something, even if you disagree, go along with the program, file your complaint later, hire a lawyer if you must, but just listen to the instructions of the officer, and a lot of these incidents probably would not happen. Eugene, what's, this is very what... true because there there is a law and order, and an officer of the law is just enforcing that order. So. If there's a problem with that balance, we need to change some laws if we're having some issues with that, right? And so it's not all on the officers. That's the legislative part. Then we have the judicial part that really needs to be that checks and balances. So it's a systemic thing. I'm not saying it's all on the officers. Mm. We need to look at those laws that are being enforced, those nonviolent criminal offenses, supposedly, that are having people locked up in jail, having people running from the cops child support running from the cops you know these are kind of law and order issues that the enforcement division doesn't have the capacity to actually make any discretionary uh, uh, decisions about so we need to really rethink again our whole idea of law and order and how we enforce it well you didn't take a breath running from and, and, and Eugene, cop. take a breath as well, because I'm going to wrap us up for now. <laughs> I did warn you this might happen. I'm going to take you all to the post show. So, Muyadeen, Eugene, Morgan, and Jamila, uh, we're not done yet, as you can hear. Stream.aldazir.com. Don't go anywhere. Hold all those thoughts, and I will see you online. And hopefully, I will see you online as well, where we will continue this conversation about who polices the police. Hopefully, see you online. Thanks for watching. Hello again, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We've been talking about ways to monitor police conduct in the United States. So, if I remember rightly, Eugene was about to say something and I was like, ha, ha, ha. hold on a minute. Eugene, go ahead. Something you heard Dean said, when you mm. run away from a police officer conducting a traffic stop, for example, right. that heightens the awareness of the officer and you begin to wonder, why is this person running away? The person running may know, hey, I have a warrant out for my arrest. I'm not going to hurt you, but the officer doesn't know that. So that raises the threat level, and citizens need to realize they may be putting themselves in harm's way because of their actions. The officer can't guess what they're going to do. They're going on what they are able to observe and based on their experience. So people need to be careful when they deal with law enforcement. 
again, it makes a lot well, of sense it, because the, the law and the policy is to look for body mass whenever that officer is in danger, right? So if we want to switch that up, let's change do not pursue when somebody's running or do not arrest somebody. Don't try to arrest somebody by yourself if you wounded them or something. Like, allow that other officer to be there. We can put checks and balances in there. We're dealing with a complex situation, but it doesn't rest upon the discretion of an officer to decide that he's in fear of his life, therefore he has to shoot. Why don't we just Well, it does rely that. on the discretion of the officer. The can officer has to that, be able to that. articulate why he's going to use deadly force. Let's let's eliminate that that space of discretionary uh, measures into into something much more narrow. Of you, you are can't. right there close to me, and now you're you're gonna you're you're intimidating me, right? So the intimidation and the fear factor, a lot of that is based on training and alternatives to use of force. If we can put more alternatives to use of force in there, all of a sudden we have expanded that moment where we don't have to jump into using deadly force. I might be threatened, but I have three or four other avenues. All right, so Mu really Muzi, that's your perspective. Let's just see if that's even realistic, Eugene. Well, I wish we lived in a perfect world and that everybody would agree to abide by all the rules. Remember, we started off with Ten Commandments. We have thousands of laws now, so things have changed over the centuries. Law enforcement. I think here in California in particular is very well trained, but sometimes they're put into situations where things don't go like they're planned. Law enforcement officers do have alternatives to deadly force, pepper spray, their batons, tasers. It is up to that individual officer to articulate why he chose to use one tool over the other. If they cannot articulate an objectively reasonable reason why they use that force, then they have to suffer the consequences. Well, Eugene, this, you, you mentioned this. training and the police force, of course, in California. And so I have a couple of tweets I wanted to direct to you on that. This is from Alan, and he says, uh, in answering the question on what ways can relations between civilians and police happen, he corrected us, and he says one way would be to stop propagating the myth that it's police and civilians. Police are civilians. And this next person, Rachel, says racist policies put these police in black neighborhoods, minor minority communities, armed to the teeth, scared and disdainful of a citizen's citizenry. It's blue versus them. So talk to us about how to bridge that gap between police as this force and the citizens that they are serving and protecting. Well, I would disagree that officers were sent to predominantly minority neighborhoods armed to the teeth. I don't even know what that means. Every officer is given a set of tools throughout this country, a handgun, a shotgun or a rifle that's in their car, pepper spray, handcuffs, a radio, maybe a taser. That's it. That's what they're going into these communities. And many of them are doing an outstanding job. 99.9% .9 of the time, you never hear what the officers do because they're doing their job effectively. They're getting along with the citizens. Every now and then something happens and people go crazy and say, my God, it's racist, it's racist, it's excessive use of force, when it is not. Are there isolated incidences of this? Absolutely. Do I think it's endemic and systemic to every police department in this country? Of course not. But we have seen instances where departments have some bad policies. Law enforcement needs to take care of that and fix those policies that aren't treating people the same throughout. All right, let me just get Morgan this, in, because Morgan's been trying to get in for ages, yeah. and you're so patient, Morgan. Go ahead. What did you want to ask? <laughs> um, this gets back to something Mouyadine said at the beginning of this conversation, which was that video is not enough. And I work with video all day. That's all we do here. And he's completely right. Video is not enough. But what it can do is kick off exactly these types of conversations and help us try and answer all these questions that are coming up. So what we need is a system that can support people's right to record, that can support people after they record, all the way to technology, social media, and the companies that create the devices we have um, can do a whole lot to make this type of witnessing more effective, make it more safe, and help us sort of push this conversation forward. And I think sort of video and the organizing that's being done on the ground in Charleston and Ferguson and we've seen elsewhere is exactly the remedy for it. See, one of the things that we noticed as we were putting the research together for this show was it was really hard to get numbers on how many fatal shootings there have been of unarmed anybody by police officers. So this is what we found via the Washington Post. You can have a look here on my laptop. So since 2005, on record, 54 officers have been charged. Now, the race of the officer breaks down into nine black, 43 white, two other. Not too sure what the two other might be. The race of the victim, 
33 black, 14 white, two other. And then out of those 54 officers charged, 11 officers convicted. Now, this is a tricky thing to extrapolate from, Eugene, because obviously we don't know all the cases here. But maybe the idea that not enough consequences, think. there aren't consequences for officers who shoot people who are unarmed, perhaps that's what's fueling these latest protests, the latest people asking, I think the police should be more accountable. The consequences. Well, it's, it's a, it's a well there are consequences. Kind of well, Mujahideen, I, I hear your point very clearly. Minute. Let me just hear from uh, a former police officer, see what he's got to say. I'll, I'll come back to you. Hold, hold tight. There for, are for consequences. Moment. Law enforcement officers are terminated quite often for abusing people, their powers, for using excessive force. Uh, we don't know this behind the statistics that you just gave us. Yeah. How many of those suspects made a movement consistent with reaching for a weapon. Sure, I mean, they could be Were all very the valid, influence? right? Just don't know, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. we don't know. But I, f I feel like, I, and I suppose this is important, it's public opinion, public feeling about maybe it being an unfair system. For instance, let me show you this, because this has come up quite a few times in our conversation. This is Eric Garner. Now, we're not going to do trial by video, because that is ridiculous. But when people saw this video of Eric Garner being wrestled to the floor in New York, they were really upset that nothing happened, nothing seemed to happen to these police officers. Let me just remind you. So he famously there, Eugene, saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And, and then that became a mantra for, for really some of the protests that are ongoing here. I think it's images like this and stories like this that it's fueling the, I think the police and the justice system needs to be rethought through. I'm what, actually going to agree with this. Yeah. Well, I'm going to agree with something Muhuddin said earlier. Yeah. We have some bad laws being enforced. Right. That was an example of the New York State Legislature putting into effect a bad law, selling right. these cigarettes by themselves, and yet they asked police officers to enforce the law. I think the legislature should be sued for putting those law enforcement officers in a position where they had to enforce a ridiculous law. That's not based. That's not on the officers. That's on the state legislatures and politicians who are putting forth bad laws. Now, once the officers are engaged, they have to use that force, which is reasonable, and then that creates a discourse on what's reasonable, what is not. But that law never should have been put into effect. Sure. And Mu you, you had something to say on this matter as well. Go ahead. Well, it's just important to not isolate it to a particular incident or a particular part of the puzzle, right? And so if there are yeah. laws and economic policies that are producing certain arenas that the enforcement has to happen and law and order has to happen, it, we're creating a systematic problem. So if you look at those numbers, those numbers are not just data points. They come with narratives of officers that are departments that couldn't find people of color to actually work in their own neighborhoods because of some certification requirements or whatever. Mm. And then you look at some of the conviction rates, the, the judicial branch, right? And so, we, we, again, we have a systematic issue that, that really is holding up a power structure. Whether we like it or not, that power structure is running our legislature, it's running our economic system, and it's definitely telling the police which laws to enforce and where. And if anybody believes differently, they don't live in America with their eyes open. See, we started with this Walter Scott video, uh, and it's really hard to watch that video. I'm, I'm just curious as to what you think about was that a particular moment? Do you think that's a milestone in uh, police uh, community relations or a milestone in the way that video is used? Uh, how, this, would you, this... how would you sum that up, Mohyuddin? And, and then I'm going to ask everybody exactly the same thing. So this is not a milestone in, in anything except the awakening of the consciousness of the public that has not believed the stories of a community that's been suffering. That's what's going on right now is the community that doesn't believe, that doesn't live it, that has some distance from this kind of terrorism and profiling is actually coming into some awareness. That's a pretty big milestone. It. That's huge. Yeah, that's, that, that's yeah, a milestone. That's but huge. as a person that gr that grows up in that, and why does it have to wait, wait until it's recognized by a certain 
part of the population until it's a problem. When it's been a problem, and that top problem has been articulated very clearly for hundreds of years now. Jimena. But now that it's articulated by a different segment of the population, now that they can see it with their own eyes, yeah. now it's an issue, and now it's a spectacle. And so that's a lot of nonsense. I hope a lot of good things come from it. But I hope people can just be human beings and recognize that black lives matter. Jimena. This is not a new conversation. We've seen it happen for decades. The Black Panthers started an organization around it, watching the police around police brutality in 1966. What's happened now is that we're at the very, very key moment where we're talking about this nationally, and it's very, very important that the people who are being policed are an integral part of that conversation. Eugene. I think it's important to note that investigators were already concerned about the story being told by this officer before the video even came to light. So there were already problems and the investigators were doing their job. This video just assisted in being able to put forward that his story was not making sense, but investigators were already on that. Videos help. They're not going to be the game changer that I think everybody hopes they're going to be. There's just too many issues with video technology right now. and It can be changed, depends on the perspective but it's gonna help, and right. this was another way to help. Right, uh, Morgan. Oh, I'm a lot more optimistic about the power of video than Eugene is. <laughs> um, I'd also say um, the investigators were on it. That didn't stop us reading news reports for two to three days of how this was a good shoot, quote unquote, and how this was a justified case. I think, to your question, Femi, um, I agree with Jamila. I, th I think this is an important point. I think I've been wrong before that we were gonna change our ways, but I think videos like this are leading conversations. We're seeing it here today, we're seeing it in the streets. Um, and you hear it, even in that Eric Gardner video, you hear bystanders. If you listen to the video, you hear yeah. the bystanders saying that this is not right, right. Um, imploring the officers to stop. You heard a whole crowd of people who were there and knew what was right and what was wrong, including the person who filmed that video. So I'm, I'm really just inspired um, by incidents, by by the the sort of courage of people who pull out their phones and capture things like that. All right, uh, that's a very upbeat point to to end on. I think <laughs> I haven't gone to Malika Bilal yet. Right, Malika, so what's the community and saying? It is the internet. Yeah. Well, I'm actually going to end on this hashtag that's circulating online. This oh. is shut down A14. These are protests happening in 30 cities on Tuesday, uh, New York, in, in California, other places. You can just see the pictures right, here. Uh, this is shut down April 14th, and these are protesters who are protesting against police brutality. So I wish this national conversation could happen between Muyadeen, Jamila, Eugene, Moore, and Morgan as well. I have a feeling that a lot more progress would be made if I had you four in the mix there. It's been a pleasure having you in this conversation on the stream. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Femi. You're very welcome. And thank you, community, for watching. Take care. Hi, I'm Eugene Ramirez. I'm an attorney in Los Angeles who defends police officers, and I'm in the stream. Hi, I'm Morgan Hargrave with the Human Rights Group Witness, and I'm in the stream. Hi, I'm Jamila King. I'm a staff writer with TakePart.com, and I'm in the stream.